All right, so now that we have our computation of these definite integrals down with our, uh, our discussion of the, uh, the uh, fundamental theorem of calculus, it turns out that these, these definite integrals have certain properties that are particularly useful and uh, they come into play here. In no particular order, let's see if we can just list these properties and then maybe we'll go through and discuss a few of them in a little bit more detail. Okay, the first property is, the first two, again, again these are in no particular order, but the first two I'm going to list are the same properties that we have from antiderivatives and derivatives, properties that we've had for most of the semester. And that the first property would be this, the integral from a to b of k times f of x dx. So this is a constant times a function. So what we have is, this should sound familiar, this is a constant multiplier. And so the question is, what do constant multipliers do? Yes, we can hear that. Constant multipliers multiply along. And so we may take this constant multiplier from inside the integral and factor it out. Essentially, this is a special type of summation. This is the limit of a summation. And we know that for summations and limits, constant multipliers multiply along. So this property essentially is inherited from the structure of what this, uh, the Riemann sum that went into this. That's the long of it. The short of it is this. Constant multipliers multiply along. If you have a constant multiplier inside the integral, you may, if, you, if it's more convenient, you may move it outside the integral. If you have a constant that's outside the integral, you may, if it's more convenient, put it inside the integrand. So you may freely move constants. You may not, 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 not. You may not do this with variables. If you have a variable, if you have the variable of the integral here, then you may not move an x, if this is dx, you may not move an x freely in and out. Those are, that's not the same property. Constant multipliers multiply along. The second is the integral of the sum The integral of the sum, and again, the sum of the sum is the sum of the sums. The limit of the sum is the sum of the limits. And since this is a limit of a Riemann sum, we have inherited that property. The integral of the sum is the sum of the integrals. And so those properties are the ones that we inherit from the fact that this is a, a Riemann sum. Now, there are a couple other properties that come into play, and again, I'll, I'll just write these up here for now, and then we'll talk about a few of them in more detail here in just a bit. So the first, uh, I'm going to, again, these are in no particular order, but the first I'm going to write is this. If the upper and lower limits of integration are the same, it doesn't matter what the number is, it's got to be in the domain of the function. Again, all of the properties I'm writing here are assuming these integrals are defined. So, it doesn't matter what value this is, but if it's the same, if the upper and lower limits of integration are the same, then that value is zero. Uh, that comes exact, this, this stems exactly from the fundamental theorem of calculus. Um, this is a straightforward computation, but that's the property. If the limits of integration are the same, then that integral is equal to zero. Uh, the third, uh, fourth, this is the fourth property. And what would that one be? That would be the, uh, we say that if we have the integral from A to B, and the integral from B to A. So what we've done here, and I don't know what I'm going to put in here just for a moment, if you interchange the limits of integration, right? So this is starting at A going to B. So again, assume we have a number line here and we have some curve here. Here's A, here's B. A to B, roughly speaking, means we're finding area under the curve, but we're going from left to right. Over here, here's the number line, here's the curve, but here's A, here's B. But now we're starting at B, starting at the right end point, and moving to the left. Now we're accruing area from right to left. If you move from left to right, this computation, if this curve is above the axis, if you move from left to right, this value will be a positive number. This value will be the same number in absolute value, but it'll be negative. And so these are equal, but 
one is the negative of the other. If you interchange the limits of integration, the value becomes negative. If this integral works out to be 6, this integral will work out to be negative 6. Uh, this, this expression on the right-hand side is negative 6. If this is negative 5, this will work out to be positive 5. So they're the same but the opposite sign. And then the last property we'll just slap up here. Uh, this would be the fifth one, I suppose. And it says this. The integral, oh, I'm going to run out of space here. So I'm going to steal some space from up here at the top. So this is property number five. And it says this. The integral from A to B is equal to the integral from A to C Integral from A to B is equal to the integral from A to C plus the integral from C to B. So that's the property. Um, again, just a quick, uh, just a quick uh, demonstration of what this is talking about. Then I'll go back and talk about each of these properties maybe in a little bit more detail. But what this essentially says is this. Here's A. Here's C. Here's B. There's the curve. I have some red, I have some blue, I have some purple. So, the purple, A to B, that is all of this area. So that goes all the way from A to B. This is the integral from A to C. So let's call that the blue. That's this piece. That would be here. And then the red goes from C to B. That would be this piece. And so it says if you take the blue, that's this bit, and add to that the red, that's this bit, then you get the purple, that's this bit. This is the fancy calculus way of saying the whole is equal to the sum of the parts. The whole is equal to the sum of the parts. What is not obvious, but what is in fact the case, is that this property is true even if C is not between A and B. As long as this function is defined everywhere, anywhere this function is defined, C is allowed to be over here to the left, it's allowed to equal A, it's allowed to be in the middle, it's allowed to equal B, it's allowed to be over here to the right. There are one, two, three, four, five scenarios, actually, and each of those can be handled in time. Uh, this, is, this is not obvious, but this property is true uh, no matter where the value of C is located in this uh, string of A, B, and C. So the whole is equal to the sum of the parts. So those are the properties of the integrals. There's a two properties that it inherits from the in antiderivative. That's the constant multipliers multiply along, and the integral of the sum is the sum of the integrals. Uh, the next is that if you have the same limits of integration, the integral from A to A, that, uh, that in, uh, definite integral is equal to zero. If you interchange the limits of integration, if you change from integral from A to B to B to A, you get the same number, same same value, except it's negative. You get the opposite of the result you got before. And then this is the whole is equal to the sum of the parts. So those are the basic properties of integrals, and maybe we'll take a look at a few of them uh, here in just a bit.